Good morning, everybody. I appreciate um, your presence here, and uh, let's do keep the brothers up at uh, Verdugo Pines in prayer that they uh, will have a safe return because um, as uh, sometimes the videos show, there's a lot of snoring and maybe not a lot of sleep, and so that they get back here uh, safely. Uh, Let's go to God in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your Holy Spirit and your grace. Thank you for the way that you move in our lives, Father, the way that you have worked in our lives even before we came to serve you or to come to know you, Father, in a deep and meaningful way. Thank you for Jesus and his sacrifice and knowing that it's only through his sacrifice that we're able to be saved. Thank you that you don't treat us as our sins deserve, but you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ under heaven. Father, we pray that this morning that you will speak to our hearts in powerful ways through your word. Thank you for your word and how you have preserved it through the years, Father, through the centuries, God, uh, to really impact our hearts today. And we pray, Lord, that we can live not just from the external, but from the internal, Lord, that uh, our hearts will be turned towards you in every single aspect of our lives. God, we ask for forgiveness for the ways that we fall short. We ask for forgiveness for the times, Lord, that we disobey or that we uh, miss the mark, Father, that we sin against you or sin against others. We ask, Lord, that you will cleanse us and forgive us and uh, allow today to be a time where we glorify you, not just in singing, but we glorify you in how we receive the message and we glorify you in how we put into practice the things that we learned from your word this morning. Father, we just are so grateful for your love for us, for your mercy and your grace. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we are going to be continuing in our study of the book of Mark, uh, and we're going to be talking about um, really continuing on what we learned last week about um, traditions and dealing with the external versus the internal. And then we're going to move into Jesus among the Gentiles. So the important thing that I want us in our study this morning is to understand that the whole context of, of everything that we're going to be studying is in the context of the Pharisees confronting Jesus on the fact that he doesn't wa- his disciples didn't wash before they ate. And that sets the tone for what Jesus goes on to do, not just with the Pharisees, but even with, with his disciples among the Gentiles. So we're going to pick it up in Mark chapter 7. Picking it up in verse 14. It says, again, Jesus called the crowd to him. And this is after he challenged the Pharisees on following traditions over the word of God. And so again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull? He asked. Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on. What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. And so we see here Jesus having to explain a concept to the crowd in a sense, in a parable, but then even deeper to his disciples that still didn't get it. Now you say, well, why wouldn't they get it? Everyone knows that what you eat goes in and comes out, right? We hope, right? That's when everything's functioning correctly. If not, we eat some prunes or drink something and then we, you know, but this was a religious thing that was taught for centuries. It was so ingrained in their thinking, in their in their spiritual DNA, that even though Jesus made it clear what goes in comes out, they still were having a hard time conceptualizing it. They were saying, well, of course, what we eat or or what we put inside our body, it affects us spiritually. That's what they're thinking when Jesus is like, no, what affects you or what we see coming out of us in actions and effect is what starts 
within us, in our hearts. So the disciples, the, I mean, the, the Pharisees, as well as the disciples up to that point, they were focused on the wrong thing. They were focused on purely the external things. And they said the ex, they thought the external is what impacted the internal. And therefore, what you see is an effect of what you ate or being defiled by dirty food or things like that. And we know today that what we eat absolutely affects us physically, but what we eat, it doesn't cause us to sin. The sin lies within our hearts, not within the donut case, okay? So we have to make sure, as, as Jesus is explaining to the disciples, they still didn't get it. They still were like, I'm not sure I understand. And Jesus went on to say that it's from a person's heart that sin really or evil thoughts really come. And when we talk about the heart, we're not talking about the physical heart. We're talking about what the concept of the seat of emotions, where our will stems, where our emotions stem. and, And that's where the sin comes from. And we understand this. And the reason why we understand this, those of us who have become disciples and who have made that leap from what what Dexter described as being the Pharisee to to truly being a disciple of Jesus, we understand that when we became disciples, we didn't have to have heart surgery. We had to have a heart transplant. We had to get a brand new heart. Becoming a Christian wasn't a matter of tweaking wrong things. It was a matter of transformation. Of getting the heart that God wants us to have inside of us and getting that heart full of corruption and evil out of us. And it talks about that from the, from the heart comes sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed. Those first five things all deal with actions. Those actions come from the heart and the rest of it deals with attitude. So Jesus was not just dealing with actions. He was saying even in your heart, the attitudes are what defiles you. The lewdness, the deceit, the envy, etc. And Jesus wanted to make sure that you guys remember this picture. Okay, remember some of you guys see a hard heart. Some of you guys see a softening heart or whatnot. But what we see is in that hard part of our hearts, we see that's where sin dwells. And we see that it's not just one sin. It's lots of sin. I appreciate what Dexter shared. There was pride, but sin hates traveling alone. It always wants company. And so where you find one sin, you usually find other sins. And and in this case, where you see actions, right? You also see attitudes. So it's not just the actions we have to deal with. We have to deal with the attitudes from which the actions stem. And this is so important because as disciples, we can absolutely only deal with the exterior and not deal with the heart. I'm not saying you're a Pharisee, but what I'm saying is dealing with the external is something very easy. Hey, you're in sin. Stop doing that. And I stop. OK, so now you're done with sin. No, nope, because you didn't get to the heart. Because I'm going to stop for as long as you're watching. But then when you stop watching, then I'm going to go back to doing what I was doing. Why? Because you didn't deal with the heart. And we know this. How many parents do we have out there? Okay. How many children do we have out there? Everybody's hands should go up because we're somebody's children, child, right? (laughs) Some of you forget that. You're like, I'm no child. I'm an adult, right? Go ahead and talk to the children. We're all children of someone. Ultimately, we want to be children of God. And so with our children, we always, you know, it's, it's, if they're out there doing stuff that wrong, we very quickly deal with the action. Stop doing that. And when they stop, if we're not properly trained in our parenting, we feel like we've done our job. And then we go away and, we, and, and, and they're, we're out of sight for the kids and the kids go back and do what they, they were doing. We don't know this, right? But... If we're properly trained as parents, and and I do recommend if you're a new parent, get some training. You say, well, I don't need any training. I'll just figure it out. Get some training. (laughs) Why? Because 
as far as when we were raising our three kids, we needed lots of help. And I've shared the stories and things like that. There was one time where our children, they were older and everything like that. And, and I would only, uh, and I might have shared this, but we would only allow them a piece of candy like a day or in a period of time. I would. And so, and I considered gum candy and that just ruined everything. They're like, gum isn't candy. I'm like, yes, it is. Right. So dealt with the actions, one piece of candy, just deal with one piece of candy, not the heart. Right. Not the desire for candy, the greed and the foolishness of no joking. And (laughs) so they would take the dog on a walk and we'd be like, oh, thanks for taking the dog. Oh, no problem. Well, what we found out later, what they confessed later is that they would go on walks and they would take candy and they would bury candy along the dog route so that they would have candy outside of our sight and everything like that. And I was like, what? But, you know, I also didn't train my children in, in, um, the fact that if you bury candy, ants find the candy. And so the Lord knows, though, because the Lord made sure those ants found that candy. So when they went back to go get that candy, that second piece of candy had ants all over it. Remember that. (laughs) Dylan's like, it wasn't me, it was Drew, right? (laughs) And Drew, bless her heart, is at ASU. She can't defend herself. But when she watches this online, she's going to be saying, it wasn't me, it was Dylan. Okay, (laughs) so however, however it happened. But. What's the point? We could be the same way. Okay, as long as someone's watching, I'm not going to do this. But when they stop watching, I'm going to go bury I'm going to go bury it. I'm going to go find it. And we have to make sure that even in our own lives that we're dealing with the heart. And that takes time. That, that, that takes effort. That takes prayer. That takes persevering. But we cannot be fooled into thinking that it's different now than it was then. It's the same issue then and it's the same issue now. We have to deal with the heart. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we willing and are we willing to deal with the heart? Are we willing to allow God to deal with our hearts and not just our actions? Because God wants a heart of love. He wants us to be full of love, not all these other things. Because even in the Old Testament, when God was referring to, uh, you know, through the prophets talking about a new time that would come in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and and be careful to keep my laws. In Jeremiah 31, verse 33, he says, This is a covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Even God understood in the Old Testament, it wasn't a matter of just following external rules, but it had to come down to the heart. And so I want to encourage us when we're dealing with each other and when we're dealing with people that may not know God, that we just don't sit there and deal with the actions, but we deal with the heart. You say, well, how do you get to know someone's heart? That's a great question. And I think Dexter revealed that you got to ask questions. You, you, you have to ask questions because we, we don't know someone's heart. You say, well, yes, I do. I can tell by their actions. You didn't hear anything that I just got through saying. Because we can put on a great front, but not deal with the inner being. And again, if someone doesn't want you to know their heart, you won't know their heart. You, they'll go on deceiving, putting on the mask, and, and people do it all the time. We can be guilty of that too. So to have that heart transformation, there needs to be a willing person wanting to have their hearts transformed. And so Jesus deals with this with his disciples, but then he goes on. And what's awesome is he finds someone who gets it. And he finds it in a woman, uh, as they say, a Seraphonician woman, a Gentile. Look in verse 24. 
Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. Yet he could not keep his presence secret. In fact, as soon as he heard about him, as she heard about him, a woman with uh, whose little daughter was possessed by an impure spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. She begged Jesus to drive the demon out of her daughter. First, let the children. Let me let me just say something here for us. How many people like scary movies? Okay, that reveals a little bit of your heart, but. There are some the, probably the scariest movies are the ones about demons and possessions and stuff like that. OK, remind me one day I'll tell you a story about how I jumped like 15 feet from the hallway to a couch. when my brother turned it to the exorcist and said, hey, look at this. Right. Anyway. Um, but understand this. The demons didn't weren't monsters. And we only knew someone was possessed by a demon because the scriptures tell us that they were possessed by a demon. Not every sickness or not every issue was an issue of demon possession. And so here she has this little girl and we know the demoniac. Yeah, he was he was a person and he did crazy things, but he wasn't some crazy monsters. And when the demons left, you didn't see some crazy demon, you know, emerge and everybody's like, oh, my gosh, look at that monster. It wasn't like that. That's all Hollywood. And so sometimes we'll look at someone and say, well, that person's demon possessed. You don't know that. They didn't even know that until it was revealed to them through the Holy Spirit and through the scriptures. But suffice it to say, we don't have to go around being afraid of demons. Oh, I see if I was in your seat, I'd be like, amen. We don't have to go around being afraid of demons. okay? but it's just it's just important to understand. That's a little tidbit there that the, the scriptures reveal when when it's a demonic issue. It's not that, you know, every willy nilly thing was a demon, demonic issue. Anyway, first, let the children, verse 27, first, let the children eat all they want, he told her, for it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Lord, she replied, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her for such a reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. She went home and found her child lying on the bed and the demon gone. You say, wow, Jesus was a little harsh, man. He called her a dog and talking about a feast and you only get crumbs. Well, remember, she was Greek. So it's more than likely that Jesus was communicating to her in the Greek language. Okay. And in the in the in the language that we speak, which is American, I'm joking, it's English. Um. (laughs) But many of you are like, amen, I speak Merkin, okay? Um, in the English language, a dog is a dog, right? Uh, and, and, and so if we want to make a distinction between a wild dog and a house dog, we would usually call it a puppy or a pet or something like that. In the Greek world back then, you know, pets weren't the, 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 the rave of all, you know, people weren't walking around carrying dogs in their, you know, satchels back then okay um and so pets were not a common thing because it was hard to have food anyway and i'm sure pets were the the thing of rich people not of poor people but bottom line is there's two different words that's used in the greek in the original text in the greek um for dog the first dog that was very common was like the wild dog and 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 i had it written down but i'm like you know you don't really care you just need to know you don't care what you can look it up yourself on google right google greek words in the bible okay um but there was a word for dog for a wild dog and that's not what jesus uses here he there's also a word for a small dog a dog that would more than likely be a house pet or a dog that was found in the house And that's the dog term he uses. Now you say, well, why would he use that term? Because he's not calling her a wild dog that no one wants to be, you know, around. But that's how the fair. Remember the context? Why do your disciples not wash their hands because of the, you know, the Gentiles are bad and the dirty and everything like that. So Jesus comes back and tells her, you know, yes, you know, she's like, help me out. And he's like, well, you know, let the children eat all that they want first. 
And it wouldn't be right to take the feast of the, of the children and give it to the dog. Give it to the house pet. I love my dog, little Atticus. And he is the cutest dog, the Andersons will attest. Right? But I would not take a plate and put steak and potatoes and asparagus and a nice Caesar salad from my children and give it to Atticus. I love my dog. I just wouldn't do it. Now, would he get the bones of that steak? Yeah. The crumbs, the leftover after we've eaten and had our fill. If there's leftovers, would I give him a little bit? Yes. But I wouldn't serve him first. And that's the picture that Jesus is painting. And that's what he's saying to her. I'm not going to give to the pet what for first before I give to the children. And she's saying, oh, yeah, Lord, I understand it. But even the dogs get the crumbs. And the dog, in, in the word for dog, she uses that pet again. Even that little pet gets the, do- gets the crumbs. She got it. And it, he's telling her a parable and, and, you know, the, the, the disciples are probably listening to this and said, yeah, I mean, he came to save the Israelites first. He came to take the message to the Israelites first. And Jesus said that. And Jesus indicated that the children of God first need to get their, their fed. But who is he among? He's among the Gentiles, the rejected of the society of the Jews, the dogs, the bad dogs, if you will. And Jesus says, no, you're not a bad dog. You're you're like a house pet. You're not a bad thing. You're just not the priority of my ministry. And she gets it. She's like, I'm not asking for you to give me the best. I'm just asking for crumbs. Because Jesus, I believe that there's enough to go around for everybody. She got it. She understood. She's like, look, I'm not asking for the wheel of cheese. I'm just asking for a piece of cheese. And, and this, this kind of looks like Atticus. Atticus is way more cute than that, that dog. <laughs> Um, but it took a Gentile to get it. And he says, for your response, because you got it, your, your faith in me, your faith in believing that I have enough blessings to go around your understanding that I want to eventually bless everybody, that I want to be the God of everybody because you get it. And because of your response, your daughter is freed from her demon possession. Jesus is a stranger to the Pharisees, rejected and opposed by the Pharisees. He's an enigma to his own disciples. His own family rejects him. And in his own hometown, there's no honor. And here a Gentile woman comes up to Jesus after hearing about him and says, you know what? I get it. You want to love everybody. Yes, you have your priorities, but you want to love everybody. Oh, sorry. Let me go back. That was I kind of anticlimactic now. So that's probably Jesus. He's like, hey, man, someone that finally gets it. But you know what? How much do we persevere in prayer? How much do we wrestle in prayer to understand Jesus? How much do we understand that Jesus desires to love everybody? You got people blowing up mosques. You have people bombing abortion clinics. You have people killing other people in the name of God or in the name of Jesus or in the name. And Jesus is like, I don't want Muslims to die. I don't want people who who have abortions to die. I don't want all these people that that literally oppose me to die. I want them to be saved. Because I love them just as much as I love you. Because Jesus died for all of them. When we heard about that, the, the, the two mosques that were shot up, what was our response? Oh, good. Glad it wasn't a church. I hope that wasn't our response. I hope our first response was, Lord, be with those families. And help them to know you through this. Make good out of this terrible tragedy. 
I hope that's our response. Because if our response is anything different, then we're, not, we're no better than the Pharisees who actually believe that there are people that God wants to die or wants to kill instead of wants them to be saved. Does that make sense? We have to get it, guys. God wants us involved in everybody's life. He wants everyone to be saved. He wants everyone to know the love of Christ. How do we know that? Because Jesus offers the same message, miracles, and compassion to the Gentiles when he's in that territory. He feeds, he goes on in chapter 8, and we don't have time to read it, but he goes on in chapter 8 to feed 4,000. Now, there's a big debate among scholars whether, he was, whether the people he fed were Jews or the people he fed were Gentiles. There's a big debate because some people are like, he couldn't, have, he couldn't have fed the Gentiles at this time because he was meant to just go to the Israelites. I'm of the ilk that he fed Gentiles because it goes in conjunction with who did he feed first? He fed 5,000 men in Jewish territory, which probably was more like seven or 8,000 people who were Jews. He fed 4,000 in total Gentiles. But he fed the Jews first. Now he fed the Gentiles. At the end of him feeding the Jews, they wanted to make him king. And in John chapter 6, I believe, they wanted to make him king. And Jesus had to dismiss the crowd. In Mark chapter 4, they're not trying to make him king. If you look at some of the, if you, if you read it, take some time to read it. What is blow away is after he fed the 5,000, he collected 12 baskets. Now remember, he was feeding Jewish people. And if you know a little bit about symbolism and and numerology or whatever, 12 represents, could represent what? 12 tribes. After he fed the 4,000, how many baskets were collected? Nope. Seven. All right. Someone that read ahead. I appreciate you doing that. Okay. Seven. Now in Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse one and two, how many nations were driven out of the promised land? Well, I mean, obviously the answer is seven, right? Seven. The Gergesites, the Hippothites and the Neocytes. No, I don't know. It's they're They're there. Okay. The Hittites, Jebusites, the uh, Canaanites, Perizzites. I mean, there's seven. Okay, I don't know how many I named, but there's seven. How many, how many, how many um, other people did they appoint? How many deacons, if you will? And that's a debate too. How many deacons did they appoint in Acts chapter 6 to take over serving the uh, Grecian Jews? Seven. Okay, and there is another connection. I forget the other connection, but there, but seven. So, when Jesus, look in verse, um, look in verse 14. I'm going to jump past that. But anyway, w- the point that I want to make about feeding of the, of the 7,000 or the 4,000, <laughs> the feeding of the 17, 70,000 people, because seven is so important. Um, Jesus does a miracle among the Gentiles that mirrors that of the Jews, but he's served the Jews first. He's motivated by compassion to feed these people. These people were with him for three days. And Jesus didn't go to his disciples or his disciples didn't come to Jesus and say, how are we going to feed all these people? Jesus initiated it himself. He was moved by compassion. He says, hey, we got to feed these guys because they've been with us three years. Seven loaves and some fish and, they, and, and, and he fed them all. Because Jesus is concerned about people's situations. Jesus is concerned about what people are going through. And we have to imitate that same love and that same concern. One way to show people Jesus is to be concerned about what's going on in their lives. Sometimes we're eager for people to come to church or we're eager for people to become Christians. But we don't want to be eager about dealing with the situations that are going on in their lives. Some people can't see Jesus because of all the junk that they're going through. And sometimes we've got to wade into that junk, not 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 join them in the junk, but wade in there and show them that God is working in their lives, even in the midst of all that junk. And we've got to have compassion on people. But I want you to read Isaiah 35, verse one and two and verse five and six. We don't have time to read that, but it just talks about um, it references a lot of the miracles that Jesus is doing uh, there. But let's go to verse uh, Mark, chapter eight, verse 14. As we start coming in for a close, I forgot to start my timer. So I'm assuming that 
I've gone long enough. So verse 14, the disciples had forgotten to bring bread. Except for one loaf they had with them in the boat. Be careful, Jesus warned them. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees and that of Herod. They discussed this with one another and said, is it because we have no bread? I love the disciples, but man, I can relate to them. They just, they just didn't get it. Jesus who fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish. And Jesus who fed 4,000 with seven loaves and a few fish. And they said, Jesus is mad at us and is warning us about the fair because we only have one loaf. I try to think of a modern day equivalent of, of that. And it would be Jesus saved us out of all our sins. He rescued us from the mess that we made of our lives. And then we hit a trial and we begin to doubt whether or not God loves us. And he's like, man, you just don't get it. Of course, I love you. Of course, I care for you. I work then and I'm going to work now. But be, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked them, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not see or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes but fail to see and ears but fail to hear? And don't you remember when I broke the five loaves of the five, for the 5,000? How many baskets of pieces did you take up? Twelve, they replied. And when I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets of pieces did you pick up? They answered seven, which is, shows you that there were two separate events because some argue that it was just one event repeated twice. Verse 21, he said to them, do you still not understand? And the answer would be, yeah, we still don't get it. What are you trying to say? Can you just tell us, Jesus? Can you ever, yeah, were you ever a kid and your parents are talking in puzzles and riddles? Like, don't you get it? You're like, can you just tell me what I need to know? It's so much easier if you just tell me how I messed up rather than asking me all these questions for me to come to some conclusion that you want me to come to, but I have no clue what you're talking which makes me feel even worse about what I did. But Jesus was like, guys, you got to get it. He says, beware. Beware of the yeast <laughs> of the Pharisees and of Herod. Well, what's that yeast? It's unbelief. It's unbelief. They're sitting there with one loaf of bread and they were worried. And yet Jesus is right there. We go through a trial in our life and we're worried. And yet Jesus is right there. We go through a struggle in our lives and we're worried. And yet Jesus is right there. Beware of the yeast. Uh, you know, we, we battle with, with belief that, that Jesus can do what he wants to do. That he, that he has his best, our best interest in mind. And Jesus asked them a question, a very compelling question. Do you have a hard heart? You know, and, and you can pick your situation. You can pick your situation. You could be in a difficult marriage and, and ask Jesus, do you even care? You can, you can be single and, and lonely and desperate for companionship. And you're like, Jesus, do you even care? You, can, you could have made some bad decisions and gotten yourself into a financial bind. And you're asking Jesus, do you even care? You could be a disciple for 20 years, 15 years, 10 years, and just reach a plateau in your spiritual life where you're just like, is it even worth it? And Jesus is right there. We've got to beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and of Herod, the unbelief that Jesus is who he says he is. And I want to close with this in verse 22. They came to Bethsaida. And some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Now, what's interesting, earlier they had a deaf and mute person. And so remember, they're Gentiles. They hadn't had all the luxury of Jesus being around them for all that time. So they were bringing all sorts of people to Jesus. Hey, touch this guy. Heal this guy. This guy. I bet you can't do it. This guy. And what would Jesus do? He would take these people into private. Because Jesus has always wanted people to know want to know him for him, not to know him just for the things that he could do for them. So he, ha he healed a deaf and mute person. And now they bring this blind man and beg Jesus to touch him. Hey, take this guy. Hey, do this guy. You know, make, make this guy better. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. He took him away from everybody. Part of the reason I believe is because Jesus wanted to be able to move around without being mobbed by crowds everywhere he went. 
And he led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus says, do you see anything? He looked at him and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Some people say, oh, Jesus, Jesus lost the mojo. He had to touch the guy twice. But maybe there's something deeper at play here. You guys are waiting for what it is. I'm waiting too. Um, (laughs) He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were open. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Don't even don't even go into the village to let people know things. He probably says, just go home. Because if, if, if you go into the village, what are people going to do? They're going to start bringing more people, and it's just going to be a spectacle. But bottom line is, Jesus kind of went in twice for the touch. And I've heard sermons for, you know, Jesus and the second touch, you know. Da, 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 da. I've heard all this. And, and I heard something very pragmatic that is still speculation because Jesus didn't give an explanation of why, or Mark didn't give an explanation of why. But think about how many times Jesus has come to his disciples and said, do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get it? And maybe every once in a while they see a little bit. They see people like walking around like trees. And then Jesus touches that guy again, and all of a sudden he can see clearly. What's interesting is his disciples, they see kind of like this blind guy. Jesus is working with them, and and they still don't fully get it. And then later on, right after this, what does Peter declare about Jesus? That you are the Messiah. They start seeing a little bit more clearly. And obviously, after the resurrection, they see very clearly. But some people speculate that maybe that second touch was Jesus just trying to help his disciples to understand, hey, it comes in stages. It doesn't come all at once. Someone said to me one time, if we knew everything that we were going to go through as disciples the day of our baptism, we wouldn't want to be disciples. Right? And I believe that life happens in stages because we need it to happen in stages. But we've got to persevere through each stage to get to where we can see clearly. And so in review... Get the right focus. Deal with the heart of the matter. Just don't deal with the physical. Just don't deal with the outside. Deal with the heart of the matter. Number two, persevere until you get it. Sometimes you just got to stick it out and you just got to you just got to stay the course, even though it's hard. Even so, even though there are things opposing you, just persevere until you get it. Imitate the love of Jesus for all people. For all people. And lastly, live as believers, not just agreeers. I believe the disciples agreed with everything that Jesus said. But even Jesus had to warn them to live as believers and not just people that agree with him. We're going to close out in a word of prayer and then we're going to be dismissed. And so I just want to emphasize a couple of things as as we as we close out everything is number one. Yes, this is taking a long time to go through the book of Mark. Okay, I recognize that every time I sit down to do another lesson out of the book of Mark. But my prayer is that you're getting stuff out of this that you may not be getting out of it on your own or you haven't got out of it for in a long time. These are lessons that it may not apply right now. But like I always say, put that shoe in your closet because it's going to fit someday. And I pray that that we could be making decisions as we go through these lessons, that if there are issues that we're just not dealing with in our lives, that we deal with them at a heart level. And and continue to pray that God will work to reveal things and to expose things in our lives that will help us to be closer to him. Uh, Let us remember Diane as she is battling cancer and and all sorts of health issues. Uh, Let's keep Sherry Moore in prayer, who is also battling different health issues. It's good to have Larry back. Continue to pray for his recovery. We want to pray for Brenda, who is recovering from surgery. She actually probably is not going to be back for maybe another month because of her foot surgery. So she, she just needs to be taken care of. If you have relationships with these people, please call them, reach out to them, see if they need anything, visit them, you know, um, and, and just let them know how much they are loved. So we're going to close out in a word of prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful. Grateful for your love, grateful for your mercy and your grace. Father, we need you. We need you in our lives. 
in so many different ways. Lord, help us to see the ways that we need to repent and deal with issues from the heart. And help us and give us the strength to do so. We lift up those to you who are just battling health issues and spiritual issues and emotional issues, mental issues, God. Uh, We are a mess in the flesh, but thank you so much, Lord, that we have you in our lives to help us through these issues. Help us to persevere through the storm. Help us to hold on to what is right and help us, Lord, to live as true believers and not just people that agree with what you say, but people that live their lives based on what you say. Father, we thank you and we pray a special prayer. We know that tomorrow's not promised. But God, I pray that we can get invites. I pray that we can go out and reach out to our neighbors, that we can reach out to others, that we can reach out to the strangers, and that we can share our lives, share our faith, share the gospel, share an invite with them, Father. God, because we know that you are always working in people's lives. Help us just to be used by you to further that work that you've begun. Father, we love you. We thank you so much. Thank you for this day. Bless us as we go. Guide us as we go. And I pray if it's your will that we can return next week, Father, uh, ready to uh, put into practice more things that your word reveals. We, lo- we love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.